right. Okay. So let's start with with the presentation. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah. Uh, welcome. Welcome to to my presentation on AI and using AI to improve existing systems. Um, I'm going to talk about how can we integrate AI into existing systems to to make them smarter and more efficient and and more effective as well. Um, so yeah. First, um, let's talk a little bit about myself. My name is Patio Callahan. I am from Venezuela. However, I live in the beautiful Scotland. Um, my background education is computer science um, with a specialization in artificial intelligence. Currently, I'm the technical leader of, of the Cerebral.com team within Charles River Laboratories. And I am also um, an ambassador of Women Tech Makers, which is a program from Google. And uh, what we do there is to support and, and guide. Um, and, and the main goal is to bring more women and, and girls into computer science and into tech. So it's something that I'm, I'm very proud of being part of. Um, I'm also part of the Google Developer Group Glasgow. And we have uh, we organize uh, a lot of community events and conferences, workshops uh, for for all of the community here here in Glasgow. And uh, what my favorite thing to do uh, to give back to the community is being part of Code Club, which is which is a uh, initiative part of um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So what I do there is that I am a volunteer teacher in my local school and I run the code club. It's amazing. Uh, I work with kids from 11 to maybe 16 years old. They are amazing. They're doing projects with machine learning and, and yeah, I'm very proud of them and I learn from them every day. So yeah, in, in the bottom of, of the slide, you can find uh, my Twitter handle. I, I usually don't expect a, a lot of technical stuff there. I, I sometimes I, I tweet a lot of, of nonsense as well, but a, a lot of AI related stuff. Uh, there's my LinkedIn and my website that one day in the future is going to be ready, but it's not ready yet. <laughs> All right, okay. So yeah, let's start. So, okay. Um, we're going to be talking, like I said, in, in, in how can AI improve existing systems. And, and of course, using AI um, it can improve the efficiency, the accuracy, uh, and the speed, and several other uh, attributes of a system. And, and combining AI with human expertise, like using AI as a tool, we can create a smarter and, and more um, effective systems that can better serve um, their intended purpose. Uh, so for example, let's, let's review some very quick examples that I'm sure all of you know. So uh, we have Netflix and its recommendation system. And of course they use AI to suggest new movies, TV shows, depending on, on our viewing history and preferences. Um, there's applications like, for example, predictive maintenance and um, General Electric. They have a platform very interesting and they use AI to suggest, um, to predict the failure of equipment and, and in that way they can perform maintenance um, in a proactive way, reducing, of course, the, the downtime and, and the maintenance maintenance costs. Um, then we have the very popular chat box. Um, and you know, many, many online stores, they use this kind of chat boxes for bots for um, customer service. And in that way, they can uh, respond to the inquiries of the customers in a faster way. Um, sometimes, to be honest, they can be a little bit annoying, but they're getting better. Uh, so, so that is a really nice application um, uh, in, in this particular field. Um, in, in for fraud detection, for example, PayPal has been using machine learning models to 
detect fraudulent transactions and and reduce uh, you know losses or or and and to make the customers uh, trust their systems um, more. And then of course we can have personalization. Um, Spotify, for example, um, they use um, AI to create these personalized playlists for its users depending on on their listening history and then. You know, by the end of every year, they do this very fun thing about like an overview of what we were hearing uh, during the whole year. And of course, like the one of the most popular applications, and also it can be um, a problem for for many many people is uh, the application on 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 cars on autonomous vehicles. And of course, Tesla, they use AI to enable um, autonomous driving, um, or at least that's what they're trying to do, and include features like self parking and, and lane changing and so on. So those are some uh, very specific examples to, to have an idea how far AI has been, um, has been being embedded in so many different industries. So yeah, let's talk about the benefits. Uh, of course, lots of benefits, like like we just just said, um, and and there are a huge amount of different kind of things that can be improved, and how this is impacting the industry industries, a, a lot of different industries um, all over the world, and I particularly believe that. This in fact is going to keep on being, um, it's going to keep on uh, growing very, very fast in the next few years. And of course, it's because the AI algorithms and, and the technologies are getting better at analyzing huge amounts of data and they're getting better at identifying patterns and, and making predictions that. Uh, uh, it will be impossible to, for humans to, to achieve alone. And there are very interesting examples of this that I'm going to be sharing with you later. Uh, so, for example, making better decisions based on data analysis. Again, um, this the data analysis is, is the process of examining like these large amounts of net data, and they can pick patterns and trends and they can um, get insights from these processes and, and business can be better at decision making. Um, but uh, the, the thing is that um, doing this manually uh, is, is obviously time consuming and is challenging for humans. So this is the area where AI can is helping uh, a lot. Um, and and the, the AI can be trained to, to do this like very quickly and, and with a really, really good accuracy. And they can detect patterns that um, a human cannot detect. So I'm gonna give you a, an example. Um, there is, a, and this is more like, a, like an a anecdote. Um, my, my father-in-law is diabetic and he had an issue uh, with his eyes and he was um, blind. He was getting blind in, in one eye. And I went with him to the hospital and um, he needed translation, right? Because as you can tell by my accent, English is my second language. So I went with him to translate from Spanish. And I was seeing like the doctor when he was doing um, all the this exam to see like the back of the eye, and um, I was I was part I, I was um, an attendee of a Google event where they were talking about the technologies that they use for um, recognize these kind of exams for for the back of the eyes on on diabetics. And I remember that, and I asked the doctor what what he was thinking about these kind of technologies, and he told me something very interesting. He said that um, he was 
um, like he, his mind was blown by the fact that these technologies can pick patterns that the doctors don't, they just don't understand where is that pattern. And he was referring specifically that they can see these images and they can tell um, that it belongs to the eye of a kid or it belongs to the eye of a middle-aged person, or maybe, oh, they can say, this is, a, this is an elderly person. But these models, they can uh, pinpoint the age of the person, let's say 32 with a level of accuracy, and he, they cannot understand how that can happen. Like they, they don't know where to look, which pattern to look for. So obviously the machines are getting, uh, or saying the machines can be tricky. These models um, are getting better at understanding and picking up certain patterns that are, are, are just impossible for humans to, to detect. So um, these are obvious, this is obviously a great benefit of, of integrating um, AI into existing systems. Um, and again, um, um, it can predict outcomes. It can analyze the, the shopping patterns of a, of a user, and maybe it can predict how much money that user is going to spend buying in Amazon the next year or stuff like that. And they can create targeted promotions, upsell opportunities, um, and of course, uh, generate recommendations. Maybe you would like to buy this particular product. And another very interesting benefit is that it will help, it can help, it is helping to automate repetitive tasks. So for example, um, one example that I'm going to talk about later is uh, dealing with physical invoices, for example. Uh, Maybe there is a uh, there is a business. They have to deal with a bunch of physical invoices. They have to store them, but they want to uh, be able to take out the information from those invoices um, and do it in the best way possible. So doing that manually is a long process, and it can it can you know a human can make mistakes, but using techniques like uh, optical character recognition or OCR and natural language processing, it, it, it makes that um, task um, so much easier, faster, and of course, more accurate. But all of this sounds amazing, but it doesn't come without a lot of challenges. And I'm gonna talk about, um, I pick like 10 challenges that we can find, but of course there's more, and, and obviously depending as well on the specific uh, industry that we're talking about. So let's talk first about that data quality and availability. So of course, uh, to be able to train these models, uh, depending on, on the kind of model that we're using, uh, we need a lot of data. And not only we need a lot of data, but also we need it to be like high quality data. Uh, that way the results of these models can be, can, 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 like the accuracy can be, can be improved. Um, however, depending on the systems, uh, they, they might have incomplete data, out of data, uh, and it can make it um, very difficult to, to generate accurate uh, insights over it. One particular problem with this um, <clears throat> related to how this data is gathered, <clears throat> sorry, um, we have very huge companies, huge, huge companies that are training huge models um, on certain data that has to be labeled, uh, that has to be labeled, labeled. Yeah, so that, that is a particular way of training a uh, uh, machine learning uh, model. There's very several different ways of 
how to do this training. But one of the ways is like, let's say we want, um, and I'm gonna oversimplify this, but let's say that we want to create a model that can recognize all of the different brand, uh, the right name is not brand, um, like all of the different kind of dogs, right? Uh, I can't recall the right word for that in, in English. Uh, so sorry about that. So for that, you need to provide um, uh, the system with a lot of different pictures of a lot of different dogs. And you have to say, uh, I don't know, this is a Chihuahua, this is a, I don't know, a Doberman and so on and so on. And to be able to do that, Nowadays are other ways to do that in an automated way, but usually you have to, you need a human to have a look at the picture and say, oh, this is a, this is not a cat, this is a dog and so on. And one of the main problems is that since the amount of data that you need is so, so big, um, you need a lot of people to do this. And that can be very expensive. So uh, sadly there has, there have been reports of these huge companies um, getting a lot of money out of these models, hiring people from third world countries, like my country, Venezuela, that is going through a hyperinflation. You can, you can uh, hire people, pay them a few dollars, and they will do this work for you. So it's, it's bringing also an in, it's, it's, the inequality is getting bigger and and you it's like a new kind of um, low paid uh, hard work. And this is like the side that nobody thinks about when thinking of all of these great things that we're getting out of AI. Um, so that's, that's about the data quality and the availability. There's a challenge around it. Then we have the integration with legacy systems. Uh, and this can be very tricky as well because we can integrate uh, new AI technologies into legacy systems, but that can be a very complex process. It can be very time consuming. Uh, it can require um, changes to existing infrastructure, changes to the software, to the hardware, a lot of testing. So that, that is definitely um, uh, a, a very big challenge, um, depending again on the industry and the kind of of um, new features that we want to bring or or support with AI. Another one is the skill and knowledge gaps. Uh, again, um, building and deploying these these AI models, they, it requires a specialized skills and knowledge. And for example, knowledge in data, data science, machine learning, uh, software development, and maybe not all the businesses, they have that kind of skills in house. So that brings more costs because they have to hire other people and so on. Um, of course, um, I, in my particular view that no is, is I, I know that a lot of people, they don't agree with me. Um, uh, I, I think this is going to change very, very fast. Uh, the way of how um, software is going to be developed and, and how, um, how the skills around, let's say, data science and that kind of hard skills are going to be um, let's say, how, how are this, those skills are going to be bring, brought into this, the companies and the businesses. But that's another story. Um, happy to talk about that during the Q&A. Uh, all right, another one, another challenge is the ethical and legal considerations. And obviously the business, they have to consider the ethical, the legal implications of using AI within the, their systems. And they have to think about data privacy, about bias and, and transparency, how, let's say, a, a, a system that makes a decision, we would like to know how did it make that decision based on, on which facts 
And of course, right now, a lot of countries and, and regions are, are working on legal frameworks on how to regulate this. And I think they're, they're being, uh, and that's just because that's how bureaucracy works, but they are not um, working on these laws as fast as they should. Like technology is going way, way, way more faster than they're doing, but they're doing a great um, job in, in trying to, to create these legal frameworks that companies will need to follow. Um, the one that is being done by the European uh, Union is very interesting. So if you are um, interested in this kind of area of AI, I, I will invite you to read what the, what the EU is doing uh, with their framework. Um, another challenge would be the cost uh, and the ROI. And of course, um, implementing AI and, and into existing systems can be very expensive. Um, and, and in terms of money, it can be expensive in terms of time and, and resources. So the business, they really need to, to weigh the, the potential benefits of using AI against the costs and, and, and to ensure like, okay, we're going to do this investment and we're gonna generate like a positive um, ROI. Uh, another one would be change management, and I have seen this in, 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 at work. Um, it, it, integrating AI into how, um, into systems that are already uh, said and that people already are used to the way they work, uh, it can be a significant change for, for, for the em employees and, and the way they work and the way they interact with the system. So um, there's there's an effort that needs to be done to uh, train and and prepare the staff for for these changes. Another one is scalability, and of course AI models they need uh, they might require significant uh, computational resources to run, and it can be it can be challenging for for some business to scale up to to larger data sets or, or more complex models and um, they need to to be sure that their infrastructure can handle uh, all the demands that might come with that um, let's say with that migration to to AI in, in their systems um, another very interesting one that I have said something about it before is explainability. And again, some models, uh, especially the deep learning models, uh, it, it can be like a kind of a black box and it can be very challenging to try to understand how the model um, arrived to a particular decision. And that can be a problem because business might need to, to um, explain to their customers why why was the 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 what's behind that decision and and they might need to explain it to regulators. So uh, for example, I believe that is in New York. This is something that a, a, a friend told me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that is in New York that there's going to be um, a legal requirement for recruitment companies to be able to explain the decisions made uh, by like recruitment uh, AI systems, uh, the decisions um, on how they, they arrive to a decision to reject a candidate or not. Because in, in, in the past, we have some very, um, depressing examples. There, there was a big one uh, related to Amazon. They were using an AI-based recruitment system to um, read through the CVs and, and make decisions. And the thing it, it was that it was um, being, it had a, like a bias against women. 
and it was uh, it preferred to select male candidates for software engineering positions, I believe, instead of women. And that was because the way the um, model was trained, it was that most of the most of the CVs that they used to train the model were for men. So the model was doing what it was taught to do. So that's that's something that uh, is is obviously um, we have to be careful about that. Another great example of explainability is, um, for example, let's say that a person goes to a bank and they want to um, apply for a loan. And the loan goes like the, all the decision uh, goes through a AI system. And uh, the, the answer might be uh, that the loan, that, that the application is declined. So we really want to know why. Uh, not just because the, the computer said no. So uh, this field of explainability within AI is very interesting, or it's very difficult. And God bless those people working on explainability right now because it's very, very tricky. Uh, another challenge would be security. And again, every software system can be vulnerable to, to cyber attacks and and we have to be careful about that and, and business, they need to ensure that their systems, AI systems are secure and robust. Uh, so this is like any other uh, software system is, is open to, to um, attacks. Um, another one is the cultural resistance. And uh, it, it might happen within the organization, uh, especially uh, among employees that might feel like these changes and this technology will uh, replace their jobs. So business, they need to, to address these concerns and, and communicate the benefits uh, of, of these new uh, AI systems and, and to, to bring trust. But this is not only on the business side, it's, all, it's also uh, on the public side. People um, might feel a resistance against certain AI technologies and they might not trust it because they don't understand how it works. And um, it's, it's funny, but I don't know if funny is the right word. Um, if you would ask people, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, are you scared of AI? And if so, why? People will like, I bet, like, and I remember they would say like, oh, AI, they will think about Terminator right away. They will say, oh, yes, uh, the robots, they're going to come and they're going to kill us all. But like the narrative has, has changed, have changed so, so much. If you ask, if you ask someone right now, they might tell you, uh, oh, yes, uh, I'm going to lose my job because of AI. They, they don't think about the killing robots anymore. Uh, but now with ChatGPT around and some weird things that are uh, the ChatGPT is replying to people, I think that that um, notion of AI is going to come and kill us all is like I mean I think it might come back soon. All right, so so let's talk a little bit roughly about the implementation. What are the steps that uh, people business uh, have to follow? Um, to implement AI in their current systems. So first of all, of course, uh, they, need, they need to clarify and uh, define their, their goals, their objectives, what is that they want to achieve with AI, what are the business problems that they have to, that they want to solve. Um, and that can, can bring uh, a better understanding if that's the right path to go because um, there's a lot of uh, overhyped uh, thinking that we can throw, uh, you know, machine learning and AI into every process, and that's not really the case. There's a lot of different technologies uh, around software engineering, if we're talking particularly about that one, that are completely fine and there are like the perfect solution for a particular problem, and 
trying to bring AI into everything is really not the, the right solution. It might not be the solution for, for the problem that these businesses are having. Uh, then uh, the next step would be identify the right data. Um, so once you know, okay, this is what I need to solve, which is the right data that I need to, to, to provide, let's say, if we're talking about a machine learning system, which is not the only AI kind of systems, uh, but is the most popular, um, probably, um, you need to understand, okay, which data I need to be able to train the machine learning model to get the most accurate uh, result that they're looking for. Uh, so yeah, they have to take care of I, that they have uh, quite high quality data. How is it stored? How can we access it? Um, and, and then identify, well, maybe we need to gather more data and so on and so on. Then, um, like I said before, you have to choose if, if AI is good for you and if so, which is the right, right AI technique to, to go. Because again, it can be machine learning, it can be computer vision, it can be uh, natural language processing, uh, it can maybe you your system can use um, fossil logic. Uh, there's there's many different things that you can apply, and and the choice of the technique really depends on your use case and and the available data and the goals. Uh, then the fun part, which is build and train the model. So um, if that's the way to go, uh, you have to work on, on all the process of, of training the model, checking that, building it, training it, checking that it's giving the right results. And if not, uh, you know, you have to do some tweakings and start again, uh, continue with the training and refining it until you get like the results that, that you're looking for. And then, well, just integrate the model into your existing system and maybe you need to do some integration, some modules, new infrastructure, uh, modifying the existing system just to, to um, make it uh, work. So now let's talk um, about some specific use cases on um, the, the certain uh, areas, certain industries. So like I told before, AI in healthcare is, uh, this is uh, getting better and better and better. Uh, the way that the diagnosis is being done is, is improving, the treatments, uh, the patient outcomes. And of course, one of the areas, like I, like I said before, um, where AI is, is helping to make a significant progress is medical imaging. And these, these AI systems can really, uh, it, they are very good at analyzing X-rays and CT scans and MRIs. They can detect anomalies and uh, in, a, in a much precise, faster and accurate way than humans already. And did help, this helps the, the doctors to, to um, make more accurate and, and timely diagnosis. And of course, this brings, um, this leads to better patient outcomes. So uh, for example, there was a competition in Asia. Um, sorry, I don't remember if it was in China or in Japan, but they did a competition and it was, um, doctors versus the machines and these were radiologists so they had to they had a fixed set of time and they had to go through a lot of images and they had to make the diagnosis so of course the ai systems were way faster way more accurate than the doctors so um it's, it's not it's not something that um, these solutions are going to replace the doctors, but it's more like an excellent excellent tool to make the doctors better, make faster and better decisions. 
Um, another area which is very interesting, and this is uh, something that we do in, in my company in Charles River, and is how you can use AI to um, improve the way that uh, all the process of drug discovery and development is being done. So again, it can analyze a lot of data around molecular structures and, and diseases, uh, drug interactions, and they can, the way that is used, one of the ways that is used is that it can, these algorithms can identify what are the potential drug candidates in a much faster way than, than the traditional methods. So of course, this accelerate the process of, of drug development that can be really, really long. And, and in that way, you can bring, you know, life-saving um, treatments to patients in, in, a, in a more efficient and quick way. Um, and then we have areas like personalized medicine uh, that analyze like the genetics of a person, medical history, uh, lifestyle factors, and they can identify potential health uh, risks and, and recommend um, personalized like treatment plans. And, and again, it's, this is obviously better than uh, for the patients. But again, this, this, is, this comes with challenges, challenges around data privacy, uh, compliance, uh, ethical considerations, and, and um, we have to be really careful uh, about this. Okay, AI and finance. Um, again, this is uh, uh, bringing so much opportunities to do improved analysis and fraud detection and risk management, for example, uh, handling the credit scores and making predictions. And, and uh, this, this has been done in a very fast way and in a very aggressive way, the way the AI is being uh, embedded into these existing systems. And of course, it can improve efficiency and reduce costs and, and provide better system uh, services and systems as well to, to the customers. Um, so one of the areas where AI is, is making, um, like has made a significant impact is trading and investment. Um, because uh, we have these systems that they can analyze like huge amounts of data in real time and identifying patterns and trends. Um, and this can make like more accurate predictions and faster trades and, and better investments decisions. And this is just getting better. And it's, it's done much better than a human can do it in terms of time and accuracy. Um, also, of course, in finance, uh, the chatbots are being used and virtual assistants to, to provide like a more personalized support to customers. Um, but again, uh, and, and this can, obviously business, they also want to reduce uh, the cost of, for, for example, a, a call center. But uh, I believe there, there is a lot of room to improve there. Uh, I love AI, I love using AI, but I hate talking to chatbots when I have to deal with customer service. So definitely there's, there's room to improve there, uh, but it's, it's getting better. Uh, another area, of course, is fraud detection and, and the prevention of fraud detection. And this is because you can have these systems analyzing the transactions uh, and, and identifying suspicious patterns, um, such as, I don't know, unusual spending, uh, analyzing the past history of activity of spending. And, and yeah, activity can recognize those um, weird points, data points, and, and raise an alarm. Um, and of course, you cannot do this with maybe millions of people that are clients in your bank. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, it can make predictions, maybe prevent the fraud before it can happen, so they can reduce again losses and raise the customer trust in in, in the system. 
Um, but again, uh, we have to be careful. It comes with challenges regarding data privacy again, uh, com compliance um, and, and ethical considerations again. Um, but uh, it is, is, is helping the way this industry is, is um, offering new products right now and, and the way they can analyze a lot of different stuff. Okay, the next one would be AI in manufacturing. And uh, um, yeah, so this uh, is, is amazing how um, AI and robotics, uh, not only AI, um, are helping uh, the manufacturing industry and they can improve the efficiency of, of, of all of the um, process and, and the productivity and also the quality control is getting uh, really good and they can reduce costs and increase production and, and yeah provi provide better services to customers and these are this is one of the areas where yes machines certain machines are replacing the, the manual work that um, people uh, maybe needed to do in the past but uh, again, it opens a new set of, of new jobs that people can also um, be part of. Um, so for example, when, when agriculture, like the industrial revolution came, uh, the, the people working in, in, in the fields, they were thinking, okay, these machines are going to come and do this work and I'm gonna end up without a job. But maybe one of these people, uh, they learn how to, um, you know, do maintenance of these machines. And suddenly he was not working on the fields, but he was working on, on the maintenance of the machines. And that was a job that it didn't exist before. So um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that every job that AI is going to take care of is going to produce, uh, another job, but in most cases, we, we can expect that. Um, some, some jobs are going to change, but new jobs are going to be um, created. Um, so again, like I said at the beginning of the, of the talk, uh, predictive maintenance is, is, is really nice. So algorithms, they can analyze like sensor data uh, from machines in real time and predict uh, when maintenance is required before a failure occurs, and this obviously reduces downtime, downtime and, and improve maybe the longevity of uh, equipment and, and save costs associated with like reactive maintenance. Um, it's also used, of course, to optimize production lines and it can identify maybe bottlenecks and suggest improvements and that obviously increase efficiency and, and increase production and cost saving. Uh, then the use of AI in quality control is amazing. They can analyze images of products or raw materials and they can identify defects or anomalies that might be missed by human inspection. And, and this can improve product quality reduced, reduce maybe waste associated with, with um, defects. And like the, all of the, the examples that I talked about before, it comes with the challenges of data privacy, uh, regulatory compliance and, and ethical considerations as well. And then the last one is AI and transportation, which is a hot topic. And um, obviously this brings uh, a lot of um, new opportunities regarding safety and efficiency and sustainability. And um, by implementing AI in current existing transportation systems, we can reduce traffic congestion and 
lower emissions. And yeah, it can help to improve like the overall transportation uh, experience. And of course, the biggest example of this is again, autonomous vehicles and AI can analyze in real time sensors. They can see uh, if the car is about to crash, if uh, it's about to run over someone, uh, detect obstacles, uh, identify traffic patterns and, and navigate through the roads. And of course, can, this can lead to improve safety and reduce accidents and, and increase efficiency. But again, this is a tricky topic because this, the, these systems right now are, are, are they still need uh, to improve a lot of things. Um, there is a lot of people that might feel um, or might say that uh, these technologies, they can be dangerous and we shouldn't be investing money and time on, on self-driving cars. But uh, I agree with the group of people that believe that um, is, is the, it can really reduce the millions and millions of deaths per year on traffic accidents that are um, that are caused by human error. So it's a matter of uh, keep on working on the technology and and be careful and and make it better. And I do believe personal opinion again, that maybe in 20 years, 30 years, we're gonna, uh, you know, uh, turn back and say, I can't believe that we were driving in roads where other humans were driving as well. I think it's, and, and we all know it, it's, it's very dangerous. Um, another way AI has been used in transportation is to optimize the networks, optimize transportation uh, networks. They can analyze traffic data, identify bottlenecks, and suggest um, other ways to, to, to get to a certain point. Let's say if we use uh, Google Maps to get to a point, uh, it will identify um, maybe the, the best way, the most optimal way to get to, to that point, to the destination. Um, this can lead again to reduce travel times, lower emissions, and 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 uh, more sustainable transportation system. Again, it's, it's related to to transportation. What we talk about predictive maintenance. I'm not going to go through through that again. And same challenges: data privacy. Where are you? Where are you going? Uh, regulatory compliance and ethical considerations. Uh, I will suggest you to go to um, the, the MIT. They have this amazing uh, project that is called the Moral Machine. So if you can Google it, maybe I can share it later. is 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 a very interesting project. So in the Moral Machine, um, I don't know if you know uh, the trolley problem. And again, there's people that they don't like the trolley problem. But this is kind of the trolley problem, but with self-driving cars. So they will show you different scenarios where you have to choose. Like the, the self-driving car has a mechanical failure and they, it has to choose uh, two options. And in each option, you will have a set of people, a group of people than the other. So uh, and another, the other option is different. It's like another set of people. So for example, it's, it's, it's very, uh, for some people, um, it can be very upsetting. But for example, it can be something like uh, run over a bunch of homeless people uh, or run over a bunch of, uh, you know, um, athletes. So, or run over elderly people or run over kids. It's horrible, but um, what they're doing is interesting because uh, they have gathered data and, and the conclusions that they have drawn around this is that it really depends like the, the decisions. And, and this is just to illustrate why this is a very tricky problem and why it's an ethical problem and it's a cultural problem. Um, there are regions in the world where they are very um, respectful of the elderly. And in those areas, they wouldn't choose 
for the car to run over the elderly. Uh, but in other areas, they said, oh, the younger people, they have more, more future, more opportunities, so run over the elderly people. Uh, I know that it sounds um, kind of rough, but go, go to the site. I, I would really recommend you if you're interested in this area and, and you can see, you can even uh, play with it and, and, and get to choose. And, and it's interesting because uh, who, are, who is making these decisions? Who is making, um, who is working on how these, these cars have to make decisions when they can be uh, in front of ethical situations like this, which will not be the common thing, but still we, we need to think about that. And, and who is making, who is working on this? So uh, it's, it's really something that we need to be careful. Okay, so um, talking about the tools for implementing AI in existing systems, um, we have data preparation tools, uh, again, to collect the data, to clean it. Maybe we need to do some transformation on the data. Um, maybe we get it from different sources and we need to um, gather the data into a, a, a single place and, and to prepare it for analysis. Uh, then we have machine learning libraries and they have a lot of different um, range of algorithms to do the classification, regression, clustering, and so on. Uh, then we have frameworks to build AI models and um, to build them, to train them. Um, there is one that I particularly really like, which is TensorFlow, especially TensorFlow EIS, because you can use it on the web and it's, it's very easy to use. And if you go to my website or, yeah, uh, you might find some some more additional information on TensorFlow. Yes, it's, it's really really nice. Uh, then we have natural language pro pro processing tools. Again, analyze and and process huge amounts of of data, and predictive analytics analytic tools. Um, and this allows business to to build and and to deploy. Um, these systems that can help them to, to make uh, more accurate decisions. And then business intelligence tools, let's say data visualization tools like, um, I don't know, Tableau might be one, but there's, there's a bunch of them. But let's talk about one tool that Filestack has, which is pretty, pretty cool. But first, let's talk about this particular example which is industries that they have to deal with form and printed documents um, for their processes. And they would like to reduce errors and to increase the efficiency. So um, um, what are the challenges that they have? Um, the first one would be like the time and the effort that is required to process large amount of paper based documents. Let's say, let's talk about invoices, right? And going through those uh, invoices, and let's talk about this a specific example, it can take a lot of time in for manual data entry, and it can be expensive and also a very um, error prone because it can have human errors on the typing, and it's very sensitive data. Um, so this is why AI um, comes in to, to help, to automate the, all, all of these processes and, and, and gather the information and, and, and keep the, the, the way it's structured and to help us uh, deal with it. Uh, so with technologies like OCR and natural language processing, machine learning, um, business can, can really automate the document processing uh, um, flow and extract the data and uh, in a very quick and very, very accurate way. Um, so again, it will improve the accuracy and, and, and the efficiency, uh, obviously cost saving because um, 
you, you don't need the ma manual data anymore and, and other kind of processes that are very labor intensive. Uh, and then uh, one of the, the coolest thing is, is the data analysis that you can do. It can be enhanced, enhanced because now you have the, the data, you have it digitalized and, and you have it um, centralized maybe depending on how your system is, is being designed. And, and then you can get insight into trends and patterns and all, all the things that we already talked about to make really nice informed uh, decisions. And this can help you, uh, of course, and, and uh, to improve the customer service. Uh, you, ca you can be more accurate. You, you can spend uh, more focus on, on, on valuable tasks uh, like providing better customer service. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna talk um, very quickly because I know that I'm running out of time about the optical character recognition um, intelligence service that Filestack has. So um, this, it, with this um, service, you can detect uh, both printed and also handwritten tests in images. And, um, I'm going to show you a little bit of the structure, the JSON structure that you get from uh, as a result of the analysis of that image and, and what are the, the information contained in it. So how does it work? Very simple. You upload an image, well, depending on how you design your work, workflow, but let's say that you want to upload an image or maybe you have them on, on a specific um, um, directory and you can go through all of them, but let's say that you upload an image and it will analyze the image. It will identify blocks of text and then the lines and then word by word. And it will draw like bounding boxes. Maybe draw is not the best way, but yeah, it will um, identify uh, bounding boxes around all of those areas. And then you can retrieve the text that is on those areas. So this works uh, with the processing API from, from Filestack. And basically it contains um, the document. Uh, it has all the information. Um, it's like the dictionary, it's a type. The type is a dictionary. It's all the information about the, the response. Uh, the text areas, I'm going to show an example after this, then the lines, the bounding boxes, uh, the text and the text area percentage, which is like how, how much of the percentage of the image is covered by text. So this is like a, a, an example of what's the structure, the JSON structure that you get back when you call uh, this service. So again, you will get uh, like the text areas, the, bo the bounding box. Um, it will show the coordinates for to be able to like delimitate that box, which is the text that is detected inside that bounding box text area. Then it will go line by line and it will grab the line, show the text and what are the words. And the bounding box, uh, coordinates per word as well. And then by the end, it can uh, retrieve the whole text that is that is um, getting in the in the whole image. So of course, when you get this, let's say you're working with JavaScript, uh, you get this information and you can uh, identify, let's say you're working with an invoice and you can know, okay, this is the name you know which area has the, the um, uh, I don't know, the, the numbers, the amounts, and then you can get that information back and send it to a database. Or maybe you want to process that information. So obviously it makes the process way, way, way more easier uh, and more effective. Uh, um, and it, it, you, you will not have to worry about human errors. Uh, so I had prepared a, a demo, but First, it's not working very well, and I don't have enough time, but I'm going to share the repo. It's working with JavaScript, and, and you can play with it and, and see how, how it works. It's very, very simple. And again, 
All the documentation is on the FileStack um, website. It's, it's very, very good documentation. So well done, guys, with that. Uh, and yeah, I don't know if we have some time for uh, questions and answers. Hi, Patty. Uh, yeah, we still do have some time for questions. And thank you Brilliant. for the really uh, insightful presentation, especially when it comes to the challenges of AI. So first question, uh, where and how can developers or students start learning AI? Oh, that's a, that's a nice question. Um, well, I will say that first of all, um, it's very, very important to understand the basics. So that includes obviously maths, statistics, and then the basics of, of programming, of programming uh, because they, they will need to do that. But mostly um, everything that you need to know about um, data science and statistics and programming languages, uh, data structures, um, yeah. I will say start with that and be very, very good with the basics because that will allow you to expand your knowledge and, and I believe in a faster and, and better way. Sounds great. Okay, so for the next and actually the last question, uh, what's your advice on navigating the challenge of the costs of implementing AI versus its returns? It really, I, I think that the most important thing is to understand and be clear that AI and AI solution is what you really, really need. Because a lot of times I have seen that companies, they want to get into like the AI wave. Like if they are not doing AI, they're, they're getting behind. And that's not necessarily the case. So maybe they are going to be making a, a very high investment and uh, probably is not needed for what they want to 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 solve so i think that's the very first thing uh to know if the investment that you're doing is actually something that you really need to do and if so then uh, there's a lot of other kind of considerations that uh the business they they need to take around the skills that they need, around infrastructure, around what's the right AI technology that they need to apply. Um, but yeah, that, that will be like the, the first thing to really consider is, is this a hype driven decision or, or not? All right, thank you, that, that's great advice. Uh, that's it for the questions and answers. Do you have anything else to add? No, just to feel free to contact me on on my on my social media, and I will share the repo with with the demo that I wanted to share with you guys. And and yeah, thank you for for joining me on on my session, and and looking for, forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Patty.